When did Roman archers first utilize a thumb draw? Ask any scholar or archery enthusiast on YouTube, and you'll get varying answers with myself included. Sirianos Magistros, in his Compendium on Warfare, specifically mentions an archery technique that involves being the opposite of pressing the thumb on the index finger, that is, pressing the index finger on the thumb, and adds that it has the benefit of pulling the string back further for as much extension in the shoulder joint. It doesn't take a genius to know he is referring to a thumb draw, though what orientation of it was preferred by soldiers of his period is unknown. Just that it is two fingers engaging the weight of the string, not three like some scholars believe. This is a 9th century source, however, so it begs the question, how far back does this go? And more specifically, why did they adopt it when they did? Well, the only correct answer is that there is no real answer, but with the analysis of in-period evidence, be it written sources, pictography, and an understanding of the general culture of the time can help us make an educated guess. But given I, among just a few others, attempt to put into practice the archery techniques that have been theorized based on evidence, I'd like to think that I can offer a unique and informed perspective on this. I put forth this theory with a the disclaimer that I'm not a professional historian. I generally try to intake as much information as I can, utilizing historians who are up to date. And given that I've also drastically changed my opinion over the course of me having this channel, then I always advise you not to take me at my word. This is a constantly ongoing discussion, and things can change when new evidence is unveiled. To observe any kind of answer, we need some context. When the empire transitioned into the dominant phase via the conclusion of the Diocletian reforms, society undertook a massive shift in how it was organized. Long gone were the days of the military being a short-term profession, but was now a career field that was highly specialized with long service periods in separate offices. This would mean that the emperors of the post-third century crisis established the military as a world of its own to emphasize experience and the necessity to retain a standing army to quickly respond to emerging threats. All of this was in response to the 212 Caracalla Edict, that saw the population of new Roman citizens expand dramatically, and so the old auxiliary system of recruiting no longer held purpose. The massive elephant in the room would be the barbarization of the Roman military at this time period. This is something that is well known to casual viewers of historical topics into late antiquity. The gist is that the Roman military resembled something akin to the barbarian, quote-unquote, martial cultures as evidenced by the appearance of male, round, or ovular shields, trousers with leg wraps, and spears. Many take this as indication of the high recruitment of barbarians and foederates, particularly of Germanic stock, into the Roman military. It was previously stated that the life of the empire was completely separated between civic and military. The Romans would further emphasize this distinction by deliberate social construct. This means that the military began wearing and behaving in stereotyped fashion of what they thought barbarians were like. It's possible that this could also have the potential benefit of being more welcoming to foederates to be incorporated into the military, but for the most part, it was a means of being distinct from Roman masculinity, which emphasized academic pursuits and civility. Contrast that with warrior virtues of what Romans thought barbarians were, which is wild and passionate, thus unmanly, but if that made a more effective soldier, then that was necessary. If you want a more in-depth analysis of this theory that was put forth by Guy Housel, I would recommend The Historian's Craft, very eye-opening explorations. What we can say is that the Romans and the military adopted aspects of barbarian fashion and weapons to create a unique military uniform that would stand distinct from civilian dress, in a sort of barbarized frontier kit, that is. The same would have gone for the cavalry, but I would add a caveat to that. It would seem that introduced both Germanic-like dress alongside Asiatic weaponry and armor for the reputation of cavalry amongst Asian nations. Such examples in archaeology include the Interkisa or Dorn helms, which bear a remarkable similarity to Iranian helms, and Bond helms are believed to come from Sarmatian tribes, along with the Contus Sarmaticus, a long spear for horsemen, named specifically for their reputation with Sarmatians, and even to a degree, scale armor, which was very Eastern in its application. So, just as those Romans and such who were in inducted in into the infantry were becoming a Goth, those who were less trained in cavalry were becoming a Sarmatian, or even a Persian. To them, it didn't make them any less Roman, it just meant that they were now partaking in this military subculture. 
inconsequential to whether or not what they were doing was accurate to how these barbarians actually did it. But to the Romans, it didn't matter. What mattered is whether or not it could stand distinct from the unique cultural interpretation of Roman masculinity being closely tied to the civilian life, thus not suitable for warfare. So it stands to reason why if Roman soldiers were consciously adopting aspects of barbarian weapons and clothing, it may extend to barbarian means of utilizing them. And this brings me to my point. We can imply that there isn't one particular date where the military was uniquely Roman, then suddenly everyone started wearing pants. It's a long process of centuries that even when one particular brand of barbarization is in play, it will still morph depending on who the barbarian of the time is. The Goths, the Franks, the Alans, the Huns, etc. This brings me to my main point. Roman infantry deliberately barbarized itself in the manner of a stereotyped German, while the cavalry evidently barbarized itself in the manner of an Asian horseman. The question then becomes, when was this normalized, and how does Roman perceptions of Asian archery technique relate to it? We can analyze Roman art going backwards in time, though we should keep in mind that art in its ability to reflect reality is always iffy, so never take anything I analyze just for what it is. Still, they are sources of some kind and are a potential window into the visuals of their time period, so it would be ignorant just to, well, ignore it. We also must relate this to archaeological records as well as written descriptions if there is any. Since the purpose is to establish the earliest possible window for any official introduction of a thumb draw technique, it's appropriate to analyze our sources working backwards in chronology. We can start with analyses of several 7th century silks. There's nothing particularly remarkable about how they portray the hunters, so there's nothing to take at face value. If anything, there's more to suggest the artists are utilizing satinid imagery to sell to a Roman aristocratic audience. Some do appear to be depicted drawing the bow, utilizing an extended index finger while the others are curled, which some have taken to indicate a Slavic draw, but I would insist that this has been a huge misinterpretation. It may be an example of a loosely held thumb draw denoted 23 and 24, which are suitable for more moderate draw weights. One appears to have the hand downward while the index and middle fingers are extended, which could indicate some form of pillion thumb lock if it isn't a middle two finger draw. Arguably, there's more to indicate the bow hand grasp of this as analyzed in previous videos, but again, I don't look too desperately to these. A little further back would be the 6th century mosaic of a couple of hunters utilizing bows in the very uh, common hunting motif that stands, spans back ages and was especially apparent in the late Roman world. They're not in the midst of the draw like archers usually are depicted, but instead are shown with their arms extended and elbows bent behind them at 90 degrees, while the bow arm is not fully straight, but bent as well. This would indicate that they are being portrayed in the midst of a post-release, but what is interesting is that they are pointing at their head with an extended index finger and thumb. Be as cynical as you'd like about the reliability of historical artwork, but the painting is clear that it is indicative that the archers here, in typical Roman attire, are being portrayed releasing their arrows from a thumb draw technique. There is, of course, the number of large, elaborate mosaics of the 5th century that were excavated in the eastern portions of the empire. These depicted hunting scenes, as is typical with this time period, either soldiers, hunting, or aristocrats. One such case is the Antioch mosaic, which depicts the hunter on horseback using a long draw. While there's nothing too physically accurate, the idea depicts the arrow on the outside of the bow as well, and the hunter is possibly using his thumb to anchor it, but we can't necessarily see the string hand to discern if it is a thumb draw or not. Still, common characteristic, and there's still enough detail to understand the anatomy of it. Another one I recently analyzed was the mosaic found in Syria that now resides in a museum of history in Brussels. There are two archers, one on foot and one on horseback. Both are depicted drawing the arrow on the outside of the bow with long full draws. Again, the hands aren't shown in enough detail to ascertain what they are using if they are using anything, anything functional at all. There was also, famously to those who follow this channel, the depiction of the archer on the mosaic from the floor of the Palace of Constantinople. Here we can see the hand of the archer on horseback utilizing, again, a long full draw, and what we could see is something akin to a thumb draw, at least the idea of it. Whether or not it is accurately portrayed can be left up to debate as I have yet to be able to replicate it to a T, though I have put forward in the past that it could be a misrepresentation of 23, what I theorized the Romans called the Persian technique. 
or at least one aspect of the Persian technique. Other examples include illuminated manuscripts such as the Ambrosian Iliad of the 5th century, which depicts a multitude of archers on foot and on horseback, but damage due to time makes it hard to discern anything if there is anything to be discerned. Still, the original, the original Iliad makes no mention of archers mounted on horseback, so this is a pretty keen example of contemporary anachronism and is a reflection of the times. There's also the 5th century illuminated manuscript that depicts the idea of what Ammianus Marcellinus would call the Scythian bow. Uh, in fact, a lot of them do de depict the Scythian bow in its archetype, which is a composite bow of a double arch shape, which accords to all other period representations. However, there doesn't seem to be anything discernibly functional in the representation, so it's difficult to ascertain the idea of how the archer in particular is using it, so I don't even know why I bothered to bring this up. Another potential example in Roman artwork of the dominant is a relief from the Arch of Constantine around the early 4th century depicting a battle scene between his troops and Maxentius's from the Siege of Verona. In the front of Constantine... In the front of Constantine's troops are the heavy infantry with that barbarized fashion and equipment, but incorporated with them are a row of archers holding their bows rather close to themselves, not really in the midst of the pool. If we pay attention to the one-third from the fronts, there is some considerable detail put into his bow hand. He, like the other two, is holding the bow close to him, while the shaft of the arrow is pointed up, being held between the index and middle digits while underneath the thumb. A practical interpretation would look something like this, which appears to be a fairly easy loading technique if one were to grab the arrow from the quiver by the middle of the shaft for more control, thus a more efficient loading technique. This mid-low bow hand anchor would only be possible if it was an arrow that was being loaded on the outside of the bow, as opposed to the inside. This doesn't necessarily establish the use of the thumb draw, but it does share the commonality with it. I've talked about the barbarization of the Roman military to mean a social construct of what they thought of barbarians and Scythians, so what did they think Scythians did? We're in luck. Trajan's column depicts Sarmatic cavalry during the first century docking wars in a parting shot. Curiously enough, with the palm facing downward, which is a characteristic of a thumb draw, connect that with a horse-bound culture from the Ukrainian steppe and the circumstances for a thumb draw is evident. What sets it in stone is backed up by archaeology. A functional archery thumb ring was recovered from a Sarmatic burial site, estimated date of around the 1st century AD. Originally made from bronze, its design features a lip, a flat surface near the opening that bends around 90 degrees with it, and the thumb to catch the string. This is remarkably similar to later Turkish thumb rings, and surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, similar to the thumb rings of Roman and Byzantine context. The number of Roman thumb rings I could find have wide entry dates between the 1st and 3rd century, and they're all not the same, but given I found these on an antique website, it's always possible that these could just be fakes, so I have to take that for what it is. The thumb ring I have is said to be of a Roman example, though the seller doesn't provide much information about the source he got it from, and due to the general disinterest in archery in the Roman world among casual and academic circles, trying to find records of the archaeological sources is excessively difficult. It nonetheless indicates the Sarmatians utilized the thumb draw, maybe not flat across the board, but to some degree, yes. With Trajan's column, it's clear that the Romans could have at least understood this idea. Sarmatians had, just like many others, been phoeterates just as much as they were enemies. It's only reasonable that the early developments of the late Roman army would have been ideas revolving around the Sarmatics. So what would I conclude? The absolute earliest, if I were to be liberal about it, would be placed around the late 3rd century, during Emperor Gallienus' reforms, that emphasized an increase in homegrown cavalry and missile troops. Cavalry, both heavy and light, could have, and would have, more or less, been equipped with the bow, among other missile weapons, in some capacity as either a primary or auxiliary weapon, depending on their role. And knowing the deliberate barbarized subculture, these cavalry units likely built for themselves an outfitting meant to reflect the idea of the ferocity of Asiatic horsemen, and could include their ways of using said weapons. It's possible that the thumb draw could have existed among Roman aristocrats in their hunting culture in limited amounts, but this can be left up to, to debate. More conservatively, I would say that the better window would be the turn of the 4th century. 
Questions of whether or not the Romans had used other techniques in and around this time period, such as the widely believed Mediterranean drawl or something else deserves its own video in an analysis of bow grips, and whether they utilized more complex or more simplistic release mechanics is up to debate, given none of our sources specifically mentions or shows these details. But personally, I think we tend to overestimate a lot of things about Western archery and underestimate others in this time period often giving a little too much leeway to ready-made answers, such as the Romans' supposed primary utilization of the Mediterranean lock in a military function, which seems to be a widely adopted assumption despite how little, little evidence there is for it. But we're not really ready to have that conversation yet, are we?